I'm not sure whether to say good afternoon or good evening. It's right at the at that uh, borderline. Uh, but hello, everybody, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Lee Kuan Yew School, if you're visiting. Um, it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce our distinguished uh, speaker this evening. Professor Stephen Kelman uh, is uh, our Lee Ka Shing professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School, and concurrently, uh, he is a Weatherhead professor of public management uh, at the Kennedy School of uh, the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, and uh, he's just arrived uh, just two days ago, I think. Uh, so, so it's truly a pleasure. Um, those of us, uh, like myself, who study public management know Professor Kelman's work well. Um, he's well known in the field for his in-depth, uh, closely observed analyses of uh, particular public organizations going through a transition process or facing uh, conflicting environmental signals and how, how they try to cope with that. Um, he's also well known for something else, which is drawing systematically out implications for how to improve public uh, organizations in such circumstances. And I think this combination is relatively rare in the field, um, uh, which is probably part of the, the message uh, that he will deliver today. In other words, we have a lot of theories and models of public management that are competing out there. Um, we have some prescriptions that come out of various ideologies and ideas about how public uh, sector organizations work, we rarely see people combining them successfully in a, in a systematic manner. He's received many awards over the years, but I thought uh, I would just pick out one because it sums it up the situation nicely. In 2010, the American Political Science Association awarded him uh, the, the Gauss Prize, which honors a lifetime of achievement in public administration scholarship. Not easy to get. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Professor Stephen Kelman. Uh, is this working? Uh, can you hear me in the back? Actually, I will. Uh, this this may be a reference that may be uh, culturally specific, but uh, it's, some of you have spent, if any of you have spent any significant amount of time in the United States, you may get this reference, which is that I grew up in New York, and any New Yorker regards the use of a microphone such as this almost as an assault on his manhood that um, uh, New Yorkers sort of pride themselves in being so loud, so obstreperous, so annoying, maybe, not, not that. They don't proud, pride themselves on that, that uh, we, we, we shouldn't need something as, 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 uh, as silly as a, as a microphone to be heard. But uh, uh, nonetheless, I'm going to use one. But you can hear me back there OK? Uh, very good. Uh, it's like said, the other observation I would make before I start is I, I was very, uh, I was impressed that I was actually Scott corrected himself. I think he started to say a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and then he corrected himself and changed it to the Harvard Kennedy School. This is one of the actions of our current dean, David Elwood. I, he has, I hope and believe, more significant actions to his credit. But one of the things he did was we brought in some sort of I don't know, PR firm or something like that to design a new logo. And the PR firm came up with the idea that we should change, our, we should change what we're called to Harvard Kennedy School so it sounded like Harvard Law School, Harvard Business School, all the others said Harvard this, Harvard that, so that we should do the same thing. Uh, and this was slightly traumatic because, uh, well, so these things are always traumatic, but uh, it was traumatic in this case because um, or at least partly because we then, we therefore took the word government out of our title. We're no longer Kennedy School of Government, but Harvard Kennedy School, and the dean had to go to great lengths to downplay any significance of this. In fact, to say it had no significance at all, we were just trying to sort of have our title correspond to the other major Harvard professional schools. So, uh, but uh, thank you for noticing that we're now we, we, I mean, you can sort of see us, it's right here, Harvard HKS. We're now, we used to be KSG, we're now HKS. So just to use another acronym, just FYI, uh, so you know what, uh, what, what uh, you know, we're up to. And actually, just one last thing, I'm, I am amazed. I mean, at Friday at 5.15, most normal people are heading home. Uh, so I, I am... 
thankful and somewhat amazed that, uh, that people are coming to a, a lecture that the powers that be at the school somewhat bizarrely scheduled for a late Friday afternoon. Maybe they didn't want anyone to come to hear me. I don't know. Uh, they try to keep it as secret as possible. But at any rate, so, uh, so let me get started. Um, so the title of this actually comes from a short article I did with this title, Public Management Needs Help, in the Academy of Management Journal, uh, which is the sort of A-list best journal in the general area of organization studies. Uh, but about 98% of the articles in the Academy of Management Journal either are about business or about organizations in general. Almost nothing is about government organizations. So that was sort of the, the starting off point for, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, for, you know, for the, the thing I did for the Academy Management Journal. And the, the basically the way I want to set up the problem I'm going to be talking about is that uh, on the one hand, government organizations are clearly a very important part of the universe of organizations in the world. I mean, in, in most advanced countries, uh, you know, in most Western countries, government accounts for somewhere between a third and a half of the GNP. So, you know, sort of half of the GNP or third to half of the GNP is in government. Uh, if you take just the U.S. and make a comparison, the U.S. Department of Defense, in terms of its annual budget, is larger than the annual sales of ExxonMobil or Walmart, which are the two largest private corporations in the U.S. by annual sales. So the Defense Department has, so to speak, annual sales larger than uh, the largest corporations in, in the U.S. But at the same time, although this may be at least arguably or at least allegedly, I, I, I haven't been in Singapore long enough to know, not the case for Singapore, uh, hypothetically, but certainly if you look in other countries around the world, there's a general view that government organizations have significant performance problems. So government organizations are important. They also have performance problems. Yet, despite all this, there is, on the one hand, very little research going on in, among the thousands of scholars who study, who, who sort of study organizations, uh, thousands, you know, tens of thousands really in the world. There are probably literally tens of thousands of scholars uh, in the world who study organizations. Very few of them are working on studying government organizations uh, in the area, in sort of what, what I'm calling mainstream organization studies, among those tens of thousands of people, scholars who study organizations. And on the other side, this much, much smaller group of people who are studying public administration and public management, the research that they're doing, I think in my view and in the view of a lot of, and I need to say not happy about this as somebody who does research in the area, in the view of a lot of people who observe uh, uh, research in, in this area, is often not up to the same research standards as those in mainstream organization studies, and thus put these two things together Let's make sure I got the pointer right here. Put these two things together, and the relationship between this up here and this down here is that government's important, government has a lot of problems, but there's not enough going on within academia to generate research to help government deal with those problems. So that's that's the essential problem that I'm that I'm that I'm that I'm posing today. Government's important, government performance is a problem, and academia, both on the mainstream organization side, because they're not doing very much research, and on the public administration side, because the research often is not of high enough quality, academia and the world of scholarship is not doing enough to help government out with its problems. Hence the phrase, public management needs help. OK. I'm gonna, I, want, I want to talk about inter a very interesting and hardly noticed, it's really, in, this has gotten almost no attention, change in so the, the nature of public administration research in academia and its connection with the larger body of research on organizations that took place about 60 years ago. 
And it's, it's really, really, it's, it's a very interesting change that's gotten very little attention. And the first observation is many of the early classics, scholarly classics, studying organizations, many of them used government organizations as examples. So if you take a graduate student who's studying, whether in sociology or political science or organization studies, and he says, look at the books, some of the books they read, when they read about the history of the development of the field and the great classics of the field. It's amazing how many of those classics involved, it were empirically located in, in, you know, in government organizations. So anybody recognize who that is? Anyone recognize who that is? Who is the founder of modern organization studies? Max Weber. So Max Weber, who coined the phrase bureaucracy, he's really the founder of organization studies. What did he write about? The Prussian bureaucracy and the Prussian army. He wrote about government organizations. These other people here, I was sort of hoping some people had, would have heard, would not heard of everybody's heard of Max Weber, would recognize the pictures. These pictures are a little bit harder to get, but uh, these are great classic writers and scholars in organization studies from the 50s, early 60s. So that's Philip Selznick, still alive. He's about 97 years old. Uh, you know, who, who, books such as TVA and the Grassroots, Leadership and Administration, are read by every graduate student in organizational sociology, political science. They're books about classics of organization theory about government organizations. Michel Crozier, the French sociologist, again, still alive, is also probably about nine, not quite as old as Selznick, but I think he's probably in his late 80s. His classic book about in organization theory, the bureaucratic phenomenon, is about the French tobacco monopoly, again, about a, a, about a government organization. Uh, and uh, Peter Blau, I'm not sure if he's still alive. Uh, Beard, Beard, is he, does anybody know? He just died. He, oh, is that right? He, two years ago. Okay. Um, Peter Blau, another great you know, giant in organizational sociology, uh, you know, author of books like Dynamics and Bureaucracy and, and, and a bunch of others. Again, a lot of his empirical research in Dynamics and Bureaucracy was in a, uh, an, in a government enforcement organization, uh, government service, or, you know, uh, uh, service organization. The, the, the research took place in government. Um, and during this time, uh, public administration was a very important field. And I'm talking here about 60 years ago, actually even more than 60 years ago, really, really starting actually in the 1920s, really almost 100 years ago. From the 1920s through the 1950s, public administration was an important field inside political science. So that's the past. And then the question is what happened? Uh, and I'm talking here, I don't know, if, again, this is an American cultural reference. The Road Not Taken is a famous poem by the American poet Robert Frost. So I want to talk about here. So this is, this is where we got, where public administration got started. And then something happened. Um, and what happened was, took place, and the, uh, it's really interesting how little attention this has gotten. In the, almost the same year, in 1947 and 1948, two books came out by young public administration scholars, both in their 20s, that both expressed very different visions of where public administration research should be headed. Uh, very, very di different visions. The first was Herbert Simon's administrative behavior. Um, he, was a young, he was a young public administration scholar. Uh, he actually co-authored a textbook on public administration. Uh, and the others, oh, virtually the same year, was a uh, book called The Administrative State by Dwight Waldo of, of, uh, of, of Syracuse University. I, think, I can't remember which one came out in 47, which one came out in 48, but these basically came out at the same time. Um, and um, again, both of these books were written by very young scholars. I think this was Wal probably Waldo's PhD dissertation. I'm not sure. Um, young scholars, and both of them, interestingly, were critical of the state of the field of public administration. They, they were critical of their, of, like a lot of young scholars, critical of their elders. Uh, and they were trying to sort of say, no, it shouldn't be like that. It should, it, 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 it should be like this instead. But the nature of the criticism they made was 
essentially the, op the mirror image of each other. They were the opposite of each other. Um, so Simon, he, in, in, in administrative behavior, Simon emphasized what at that time would have been called efficiency. We would probably today say performance as a goal for what public administration scholarship should be about. And in terms of methods, he emphasized social science methods as the way public administration research should be done. And he was critical. He, I, I mean, he, it, that, at that point, uh, there was a big emphasis on efficiency in existing public administration. His main criticism of the field was that their social science methodology was, was too weak. Um, so his sort of path forward was increase the sort of social science sophistication of public administration research. Um, Waldo had a very different view. He had an opposite criticism. Um, he had a strong, the central argument of his book, and while sort of, uh, Simon basically agreed with the existing emphasis in public administration literature on efficiency as a goal, and, and his criticism was, uh, was on the methods. Waldo's emphasis was attacking efficiency as a goal and said, no, 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 this, is, this has gotten public administration completely on the wrong track. What we need to do is have a, pub, a public administration that is, sort of centers around the idea of what he called democratic administration. So how do you get people more involved in, running the, in, in participating in, in, in running the government? And then as a subsidiary point, although it wasn't, a, it wasn't quite his main point, he didn't like the idea. He thought there was too much social science in public administration research, that, there, that, that um, uh, there, it, was, it was too social scientifically oriented. And instead, public administration research should reorient itself to becoming part of political philosophy. Uh, um, and so these are very obviously. It, you know, two books by two young people, both got a lot of attention, uh, had very, very different messages. So what happened? What was the reaction to the two books? Um, I think that the problem, or a problem, just from a reputational perspective, that public administration had at that time, now again, most public administration scholars at that time were in the political science discipline. Their PhDs were in political science. Some were in sociology, but most were in political science. And a lot of other political scientists were very contemptuous of public administration scholars on the grounds that they were sort of, to use an American slang, they were too much in the weeds. That, in fact, the word, while the word that was used at the time was that public administration just cared about manhole covers. Manholes are the you know, things, you know, the use of, I, don't know, I guess there are water lines underneath or something. The point that the, that the political scientists were making was that political science should deal with you know, huge questions of the future of mankind and, and you know, you know, very, you know, various either normative or empirical questions at a very, very high level, and that public administration was just dealing with the details of how do you run the government better. And that was sort of not very important or not very, certainly not, not intellectual enough or whatever. So, they, so that criticism from political scientists put public administration really on the defensive. And I think made a lot of public administration scholars sort of very receptive to Waldo's message because it seemed like he was sort of redirecting or he was trying to redirect public administration from manhole covers to sort of lofty questions of political philosophy and, 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 and so forth. And so what happened? Waldo became an icon of the field of public administration. In fact, if you look at the major, the, the most prestigious award, even more prestigious than the Gauss Award, uh, he, uh, this, my award is the second most prestigious award, maybe, whatever. Um, uh, the, the most prestigious award in the public administration field is the Waldo Award, the Dwight Waldo Award, uh, which is not even given every year. It's sort of like every once in a while when they see sort of somebody you know, uh, who, 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 who can get this award, they, 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 they give it to him. In fact, actually, it was once given to Herbert Simon, which was particularly ironic because the two of them fought each other uh, 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 a lot. So Walden became an icon of public administration, although it should be noted, 
No, there, I don't believe there's a single actual political philosopher, certainly in the United States, perhaps in the world, who's ever even heard of Dwight Waldo. And as he, although he tried to move public administration in the direction of political philosophy, he made no contributions that were, that were regarded as important by actual political philosophers. But within public administration, he became an icon. So Waldo becomes an icon of public administration. Simon becomes an icon of social science more generally. The man win, won the Nobel Prize. But he leaves public administration, sort of disappointed by just the, the move away from social science and the move away from, you know, from, 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 from more rigorous research. So what, what comes out of this period of the late 40s and, and, and the 50s is this situation where public administration sort of gets you know, re, you know, redirected from a concern with performance to a concern with political philosophy or sort of I guess I would call it amateur political philosophy, since again, it has no real standing among professional political philosophers or, or people who do, who do political philosophy. Um, uh, and the early, the, instead of becoming more oriented towards social science research, it becomes less oriented. And what, what results from this is the creation of what I called a public administration ghetto. Um, and where public administration as a research field became separated from the mainstream of social science and the mainstream of organization studies. I'm going to show you a chart here that's very, very hard to read, so I'm just going to, it's sort of very busy. Uh, but this is articles in Administrative Science Quarterly, which is one of the main journals that Deal, that it was actually sort of started by sociologists in the 50s that deals with, with studying organizations. What, and what, I, what a research assistant for from, from me did is actually looked at all of the articles in public, excuse me, in, in administrative science quarterly from the beginning every year to, and classify them as, are they about government? Are they about business? Are they about nonprofits? Are they general theory articles or whatever? And again, this chart is very busy, but what I want to call your attention, so, so here's where, they, where it starts, 1958, first two years. So at the beginning, um, business is here, about 20%, and government is about 30%. So the first two years of Administrative Science Quarterly, 30% of the articles deal with government. 30%, one third. Uh, and only 20% deal with business. Look at the end of the period. Business is up to 70% of the articles are dealing with business. And Governors actually can't really see it. It's, it's, it's like 4%. So during this period, essentially mainstream scholars studying organizations essentially stopped studying government. So government moves from 30% of the articles down to 4% of the articles. Business moves from 20% of the articles up to 70% of the articles during, you know, during, you know, during this period of time. Uh, it's, again, this chart is a little busy, but, but, but quite, quite striking. Um, so, uh, and you know, I, I, I think this 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 both just sort of says says what what you know what I just said that the the mainstream of organizational studies stop studying government, start studying business, uh, and and just sort of you know changes its focus, and. He, and in terms of the ghetto, I sort of use this word public administration ghetto. Here, are, so the Academy of Management is the major organization of mainstream organization studies. Uh, um, the sort of people who study organizations. Then there is also the American Society for Public Administration, which, has a, which is partly, mostly practitioners, but also has some scholars. This is their, they have a research section. And the American Political Science Association, which is the organization of political scientists, also has a public administration section. Now let's look at the size of these organizations. So the Academy of Management has 17,000 members, 17,000. The research section of the American Society for Public Administration has, I don't want to guess, 355 members. The public administration section of the American Political Science Association, 
515 members. So you have this tiny ghetto of public administration scholars that is in their own sort of little world. It's a small world uh, while you have this enormous group now, actually, interestingly, the Academy of Management has a public and nonprofit organization section. I'm a, I'm a member of it. That is about 1,000 members. So actually, that has more members than the specifically public administration uh, uh, organizations. Um, so then that's, that is the, the sort of the ghetto that got established. And so that's the situation that I'm concerned about. Again, sort of just to summarize where I've gone up here. Um, Government needs help. Governments often are not performing as well as they should be. Academics, in my view, have a responsibility to try to help because government is, a, is an important part of, of the world and of organizations in the world. But we've ended up or we've landed in a situation where you have this large body of mainstream organizational researchers who are not studying government and then a tiny body of isolated or at least for a long time, been isolated public administration scholars who are studying government but not doing research of a high enough quality. That's, that's the essential problem we need to deal with. And so my argument is that um, uh, sort of look at a way forward, and there's a way forward both in terms of what, what public administration scholars should be studying and also research methods for, you know, you know, for, you know, for public administration scholars. Um, and I think a key event here in terms of, of, of uh, you know, the study of, of government performance as a key um, topic for public administration research is starting in the early 1990s, you know, really during a time of, certainly in the Western world, of lots of disappointment with the performance of government, lots of anti-government sentiment and so forth. Um, there really began a significant move, movement, not by scholars really so much, but more by practitioners, by people inside government who wanted government to work better and who, you know, who cared about government working better, to try to focus more inside government on the performance of government, uh, uh, government organizations. Um, uh, and that movement has been given the name by some public administration scholars, and it's often, which we'll talk about used in a negative way, as the so-called uh, uh, new public management. And that movement in, among, in, among the world of practitioners has been characterized by phenomena such as more interest in performance measurement in government, more interest in customer service, that government should be serving citizens, not, you know, like looking down on citizens. A, a whole bunch of phenomena in, in the developing world work against corruption. There are a whole bunch of phenomena that are associated with this movement among practitioners in the first instance for, uh, you know, more focus on, gov on, you know, on government performance. Um, and the good news is that there are many contemporary public administration scholars, so I, don't want to def I definitely don't want to paint too negative a picture, who have embraced that movement towards focusing on performance and results as a, as a, as a goal for public administration research. And uh, um, again, a, a you know, number of scholars, I just sort of cited, cited a few, you know, few sites of, of people who write from that kind of perspective. At the same time, although it's true that lots of public administration scholars, particularly in recent years, have embraced what's often called a performance movement, there have also been lots of people in public administration who've resisted this. Uh, I refer to this in something I've written as the Empire Strikes Back, uh, that, that sort of have said, no, 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 we don't, we, you know, we don't like this new trend. And there are a bunch of elements of the criticism. Uh, and, you know, and, and they actually have some common features. I mean, one is objecting to what they perceive as bringing business techniques into government. So that's not a good idea. It's often the phrase that's, or the word that's often used to describe it as, quote, unquote, managerialism. Um, that, and that's, that's considered to be bad. We don't, in, in the view of these public administration scholars, we don't want to bring 
management techniques into government. That's, that, that's, that, that's, that, that's not a good thing. Uh, and they, these, these people also object to the idea of customer service as a appropriate goal for what the government's trying to do. And the criticism that's made is that seeing people who receive government services using the word customer to describe them is in, devalues them compared to the more lofty status of citizen, that, that people should be treated as citizens, not as customers. And the argument behind, and that just is a bunch of words, the argument behind that is that if you tell citizens they should see themselves as customers, it encourages people to see themselves, it's too, their, their relationship with government is too selfish. You know, what is government doing? It's just providing me personally with a service rather than the idea of citizenship, which is, has more of a common venture to it and more of a sort of a sense of, of obligations and, and, and responsibilities as well as just I'm getting a service. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll give my view of that in a second. Maybe I'll, 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 I'll hold off on my reaction to that criticism, but that's another criticism that, uh, that, you know, that get, gets made. And then third, uh, a lot of these people, one of the features of, of, the, of, of the, both the scholarship and the practitioners in the new public management was a call for civil servants and government officials to be more entrepreneurial in the sense of not just accepting the organizational status quo as a good idea, particularly if the, if the organization was underperforming, but actively trying to take steps to change an organization, improve an organization, and so forth, the way an entrepreneur might try to do in a private sector context. So, that, so the, the words of public sector entrepreneurship was used, and again, these people didn't like that, and th that they criticized on a, a sort of a, a view that, one view in sort of classic, both American and European public administration theory, and it's, it was a controversial view even at the time, which sort of says that in a democratic society, civil servants should take no initiatives of their own. That what the role of civil servants is simply to obey the political officials and to be sort of completely passive and not do, you know, not take any initiatives of, of, you know, of their own. Uh, and that the idea of entrepreneurship in the public sector went against this theory that a, the role of a civil servant was, was to be completely passive. Again, I'll give my, my own view on this in, maybe in, in, in a second. And then the final criticism, this is all what I've called the empire strikes back. Uh, that these that the critics of the emphasis on performance sort of responded by sort of saying you know sometimes they often said something which is clearly true which is per, you know performance is not the only goal of a government a government also you know things like fairness due process uh, treating people with respect and so forth are also important which nobody would disagree with, but they took that further to say, I mean, in effect to say, and they, to say the performance values are not important at all. The, only, the really important values are, you know, government treating people with respect and fairness and, and, and various kinds of process values. So that was sort of essentially um, the, uh, you know, you know, the criticism that people made. So let me, so my own reaction to these criticisms. Um, so, I guess on a fundamental level, I guess I would say a philosophical level, especially in situations and societies, not the least many Asian societies, where government traditionally has treated people very much as, not as citizens, but as subjects, as, as people who, you know, where the role, public officials basically, they exploit people, they don't serve them. Uh, that criticizing the idea of customer service as a model for the relationship between citizens and, 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 and government officials, again, I would say in many ways, even particularly in many traditional government arrangements in, in, in Asian societies, in Asian societies, condemns ordinary people to very bad and exploitative treatment by 
government officials. And I've also sort of said that this, idea, this metaphor of, custo of customers as a way of sort of thinking about the relationship between government officials and, and, and citizens works better in practice than in theory. And what I mean by that, there's often this phrase you've probably all heard, you know, X or Y or Z works, this works well in theory but doesn't work in practice. I actually think the idea of customer service or the customer concept in the public sector works better in practice than in theory. In theory, yes, is there some, you know, is, so is, is, it, is it perhaps inferior to the idea of a citizen, of some common enterprise, and, and is, is there a danger that a customer idea makes people too selfish? Yes, in theory, that's a problem. However, I think in practice, the customer metaphor is an extremely galvanizing and powerful metaphor that has a real potential to improve the way government treats people for the simple reason that everybody understands what it means to be treated like a customer uh, in a mar certainly you know, in a market society that that concept is very intuitive that the, you know the idea that being treated like a customer means that you're sort of running the show I mean you ch you choose you decide the, the purpose of the organ of the business is to serve you if they don't serve you, you they don't get your business that everyone Every normal person, including civil servants, understands that idea. So I think that if you say to civil servants, um, we want you to treat citizens the way a good company treats customers, it's, it's very intuitive. It's not hard to understand. And I think it has, has the ability to, you know, to, you know, to galvanize behavior. Um, and so I think that, you know, the criticism that the sort of the, the traditional public administration people make again of this performance orientation is, I guess, in a fundamental sense, really, in, I guess I would say, in a normative or an ethical sense, letting pe letting down the citizens of a country. It's it is it's it's not setting you know high enough demands on government. It's letting government off too easy, again, to use an American language metaphor. It lets government off too easy, you know, to sort of say, well, government doesn't need to worry that much about performance. There are other things, you know, there are other things that are more important. And then finally, uh, I would say that it leads to a situation, I mean, there are, I mean, certainly in the U.S. and Western Europe, I, 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 I don't know the insides of, of, of Asian civil services well enough, and I'm sure there's also differences you know, in, in different Asian countries, but certainly in the U.S. and Western Europe, there are a lot, you know, the best practitioners, the best civil servants, the people who sort of career people in government, really are trying to improve how government is performing and how well government is doing in serving the people of the country. And if public administration scholarship doesn't produce research that helps those people get ideas or sort of approaches that can work better in trying to improve government performance, government is letting those practitioners down. And th through letting those practitioners down is also letting, you know, letting, um, uh, you know, letting ordinary people down. Let me tell you one thing that's not on the slides, on this, on this sort of philosophical argument about the job of a civil servant is only to obey the, you know, the, 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 the politicians. This is an old debate, really, 70-year-old debate in, in, in public administration. And I guess my view is a, I guess I would say somewhere, some, you know, something of an of a in-between or, or, or moderate view, that I think that it is logical and rational if you are a politician. The career civil servants have a lot of expertise, a lot of knowledge, a lot, a lot of times often more knowledge and expertise about different public policy areas than you have as an elected official. It is in that situation, it is rational for elected officials or for, or for politicians to, allow, to ask or to only allow or even ask um, career public officials, career, you know, you know, career civil servants, to take some initiative to come up with suggestions, ideas, and so forth. No, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, that the 
career civil servants can, you know, should be able to impose those ideas on people. I think they need to be subject you know, to political debate and, and in, at least at a minimum veto power by the elected officials. But if I were a politician, I would not want career civil servants to simply be passive and just wait for my orders because I may not know what orders to give them. I would want to hear their ideas. And, and so I think that it's, 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 I mean, so even from a, a democratic theory perspective, I mean, if it, 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 in my view, is rational and it's not, it doesn't violate democratic theory for politicians to say, we democratically make the decision to authorize civil servants, career civil servants, to participate more actively in policy formation and in, in, in political debates. So in terms of uh, um, what you su study, my view, the way forward is reestablish performance as a central topic that public administration research needs to study. And, and the, what we should be focusing on, and I'm, I'm, I clearly don't want to say that's all anybody should study, but in my view, the central research topic for public administration should be how can government improve its performance and, and, and deliver better for people. Uh, in terms of research methods, and again, this is probably not going to surprise you, you know, given the, 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 you know, the first part of the talk, my view is that the way forward for public administration is greater use of conventional and mainstream social science methods in, 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 in the research. I mean, it's interesting, if you compare the leading mainstream journals in organization studies, such as Academy Management Journal, Organization Science, whatever, with public administration journals, you'll see, number one, in the mainstream journals, a lot more use of econometric methods, regression analysis, and sort of you know, fairly sophisticated regression analysis uh, in, you know, in, in, you know, in, in, in the research. A lot of use of lab experiments and psychological experiments uh, in, in, in you know, developing research findings. Um, and what I'm calling here sort of discipline quantitative, qualitative research. And by discipline qualitative research, I mean qualitative research, but research that is, that is careful about things like how do you choose whom to interview, how do you code the data, inter-rater reliability. I mean, there are you know, courses, I mean, just like there's you know, work on quantitative research methods, there's also work on qualitative research methods. And I think you'll see in the mainstream journals, again, compared with, uh, with public administration journals, more use of disciplined uh, qualitative research as opposed to less disciplined qualitative research. Um, I think that there is, by, the, what, what you see more of in public administration is case studies of various kinds, uh, sometimes what's, what's, what's often called best practices research. Um, as has begun to be pointed out, uh, I, mean, there, I mean, you know, case study research can be and often is very helpful either in generating, you know, if you don't know very much about something, trying to learn more about it so you can sort of generate ideas or hypotheses that then can be tested in other contexts, uh, or sometimes for getting the kind of deep understanding of a phenomenon that's hard to get with the, sort of the less amount of data you have in quantitative studies. The problem with this fairly well-established, although it's now fortunately losing, because it's been criticized a lot, we've got, we've got to be criticized a lot, losing, uh, losing some, some traction, the best, what best practices research does is says, okay, we want to, I mean, the good news, the good part of it is they're trying to figure out how do you get a government organization to perform better. But the method they use is they say, let's look at a government organization that performs well and see what it does. The problem with that is what econometricians call selection on the dependent variable. Now that's a fancy word that, or fancy expression, but intuitively what it means is if you, so you say, Here's an organization that performs wonderfully, and we're going to just look at it. Uh, or let's say here's a you know a, a government that's not corrupt, and we're going to look at what does this government that's not corrupt do, and so, so what what are its anti-corruption strategies and approaches and so forth. 
and therefore you say, okay, it does A, B, C, D, E, so if you want to stop corruption, do A, B, C, D, E. The problem with that methodologically is, unless you look at a government that is corrupt, you, you, without the comparison, you don't, I mean, because you might find that, you, that you've studied the government that's not corrupt and you find out it does one, two, three, four, five. You may well go and study the government that is corrupt and discover it is also doing one, two, three, four, five. Um, so unless, if you just looking at the best practices can, does not allow you to really draw conclusions, you have to compare it with the worst practices or, or, or other practices uh, in order, and, and see where the two differ in order to draw, you know, draw conclusions. But there's been traditionally, and if you read the public administration journals, they are traditionally or have been weak on these and a lot, uh, you know, a, a lot of those. Having said all that, there have been, I would say in the last 10 years, major improvements. Again, I, I tend to be an optimistic person, so sort of the good news is a lot of improvements uh, in, 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 the, in, in, in the last five to ten years in public administration journals. So if you, you, know, if you read the, probably the best journal in the field right now is a journal of public administration, not probably is, the best journal in the field is Journal of Public Administration Research and Theory, you are definitely seeing more pretty good econometric research. It wouldn't it would probably, a lot of it, have a hard time being published in the best organizational journals, science journals, but it's, but it's pretty good. Still not very many psychological lab experiments, although begin, we are just beginning to see lab experiments used in public administration research. And a pretty significant growth of discipline qualitative research, so improvements in qualitative research. And Fewer case studies, less best practices research. I also added on my own, the journal I edit myself, International Public Management Journal, uh, which we are actually now number three ranked on SSCI among public administration journals. We're very proud of that. Um, we're, not, we're not as good as these guys. Uh, but we are also, I mean, we, we actually explicitly have adopted as our mission to try to bring mainstream organization research and public administration research closer together. And a, a lot of the people, really unique among public administration journals, uh, probably about a fourth of the people on our editorial board are not public administration scholars at all. They are general organization study scholars, often very well-known ones like Carl Weick at the University of Michigan or, or Paul DiMaggio at Princeton or, or um, uh, Kathy Sutcliffe at University of Michigan and, and, uh, and so forth. So uh, we, are very, we are very explicitly trying to bring these two together. And I guess I would also add, stay, staying with the good news, Somebody should do, wouldn't take so long, a, a, look, a study looking at the citations at the end of papers in, the, in Journal of Public Administration Research and Theory now versus 15 years ago. I am certain you will find a major, a significant increase in citations to articles from outside of public administration. So this sort of ghetto thing is really starting to break up. I mean, you, you see, I'm just, not anecdotally, I sort of see it when I read the papers my, you know, myself. 15 years ago, everything in that, that journal, virtually all the sites were from other public administration scholars. Now they are much, much more. Uh, my guess is 25% of the sites in a lot of articles in, in, in JPART are, are from outside of public administration, which to me is very, very good news. Um, yeah, so if this happens, I'm actually almost done, so we're going to have some time for, for questions or, or, or whatever, or, or alternatively go home for dinner early. Um, wait, last thing, you know, topics for research, because I, I guess the point I want to make here is that I think that there are a lot of um, elements of management which are common to any organization, to, ma to good management of, a, of public organizations and private organizations. Indeed, I think in about two weeks or at some point I'm going to give a, another lecture on, on, on that topic. But, um, but there are also topics that are different, or not topics that are different, there are phenomena that are more important in public organizations than in private organizations. So, I th so my hope is that both mainstream organization scholars and public administration scholars will apply good organization studies methods to a bunch of problems which are 
really not unique for the public sector, at least you know, unusually important for the public sector. So some of them are, I'm going to list a few of them here, is you know, the, the what do we think about bureaucratic organizational forms. By bureaucratic organizational forms, I mean lots of use of rules to design an organization, um, a, a more hierarchical approach to organizations, a more stovepipe or siloed approach to organizations. All those are features of bureaucracy. All of those features are more common in government organizations than in lots of private organizations, although they're present to some extent in many private organizations as well. And I think we need more good research about the both advantages and disadvantages of bureaucratic organizational forms in government where they are, where they're particularly prevalent. Um, second is studying, is, is more research on non-financial performance measures. There's a huge amount of research among business scholars about the impacts and, and you know, and so forth of financial performance measures, you know, stock bonuses, performance pay, and so forth, uh, uh, but you know, various kinds of financial performance incentives uh, in, in, in the business world, um, except probably in Singapore, financial performance uh, incentives play a quite small role in government management. But on the other hand, the, on the business side, people are study much less, or they study a little bit, things like the balanced scorecard and so forth, non-financial performance measures. By that I mean performance measures like the crime rate, the death rate from heart attacks in a hospital, um, the air quality, you know, you know, air pollution levels. Those are all non-financial measures of the performance of government. Uh, or of, of either government organizations or of government, you know, government policies. I think we need more research on using non-financial perform performance measures to manage and improve the performance of organizations. That's, again, an issue that's more important in, in, on the government side than on the, uh, the non-government side. Uh, third is something that, that's actually beginning to get a lot of attention in public administration scholarship that's often called uh, public service motivation. Um, and public service, the study of public service motivation sort of starts off sort of in some sense by saying it is unlikely in most government organizations that there are going to be a lot of you know, financial incentives to motivate better performance. In that context, what are some of the other kinds of ways you can motivate improved performance by civil servants and government employees? You know, one is non-financial performance measures, but a second is what's called in the literature public service motivation. That is to say the, 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 the motivating force of a desire on the part of at least some civil servants to serve people to do a good job. And, and so the managerial issue here is how do managers use public service motivation both as a criteria for hiring people, but then also as a way to motivate better performance from, from existing employees. There's some, a growing amount of interesting research on this. Actually, some the, the, my favor is actually, unfortunately, not done by a public administration scholar, but a, a young uh, guy who's at a, at, at a business school, but who's interested in what he calls pro-social motivation. Although he studied some government organizations, he, what he's interested in is um, the impact of exposing employees to the people who's, who are being helped by the work they do on the performance of those employees. So he's done a number of really, really interesting studies that uh, he and some, some, some colleagues, um, I'll just cite two of them, but this is a very, very interesting area of research. He, d he did a very, very interesting field experiment among fundraisers who were raising money over the telephone for the University of Michigan, which is where he went to graduate school. So they were raising money for the university for a scholarship program. And he gave a, a random sample of, you know, random, you know, sample of half of the fundraisers got to meet one of the students for whom they were raising, who were being helped by the scholarship that they were raising money for. And they had lunch with them and so on. And then the control group didn't, they just didn't meet them, met, you know, just did their job. And they found, he found that 
six weeks later, so it was like a fairly, a fairly long period of time later, the group that had had lunch with a student whom they were helping with the raising money for, you know, for the scholarships, during the next six weeks, raised, it's unbelievable, twice as much money as the control group uh, after this, you know, this fairly short exposure to somebody whom they were helping by, by, by their efforts. There's a similar, not similar, there's an interesting study by, uh, some, uh, by some Israeli organization scholars, I think an Israeli hospital, where they were trying to look at ways to encourage doctors to wash their hands before an operation. With the, because that's a very, just some of you probably know, a big source of, 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 of disease that, that of, of doctors who haven't washed their hands before surgery and you know, get the pages get affected and so forth. And they, they, they compared the impact of, they again randomly assigned two different kinds of signs that they put right by the, um, the um, you know, in the bathrooms. And one sign sort of said something like, you know, you know, why, you know wash your hands so you don't get infected. So it was a sort of, it was a, this is what, so what's in it for you message about, about the impact. And the other sign said, wash your hands to save your patients' lives. And they then actually measured in the two different bathrooms the amount of soap, because liquid soap, that was used in the soap dispenser. So they had a very good measure of, of um, this is, this is what, what smart researchers do. They come up with interesting ideas like this. And what they found was that the, there was more soap used uh, among the people who saw this pro-social message, wash hands to save people's lives, than there was among the people who got the, so the selfish message, wash hands to, you know, so, you, you know, so you don't get sick. Um, and so there's a lot of interesting research beginning to go on in, in this area of public service or pro-social motivation that I think really needs attention in the public sector because this is the one area where the public sector has an advantage over private business, that the, the work that's being done is often much more meaningful and helps people. And I think we don't make nearly enough use of this uh, in, in government as a way to motivate people. So that's another area that I think needs you know, public administration scholars should be working on, actually are working on. Um, then, you know, uh, another area that is particularly important in the public sector, much less important in the private sector, is what I'm calling rare events. You know, emergencies, tsunamis, floods, earthquakes, finding terrorists, sort of managing rare events. How do you manage an event that is almost never happens. You don't, you, you don't have sort of ongoing organizational capacity to deal with it, or that is very, you know, very, you know, you're looking for a needle in a haystack, like, like you know, trying to find terrorists. Um, next one, an area where I'm doing research right now, and I'm actually gonna be presenting two papers on, on, on this topic, is the increasing use in go both inside government, but also in between, between government and NGOs or, or businesses of collaborations across organizational boundaries to produce something. And again, it may be public-private partnerships, it may be collaborations inside of government. These are more and more being used in government. There's a moderate amount of research on this, but we know very, very little, frankly. I, I'm hoping, I'm trying to get some try to bring our knowledge forward in some of the research I'm doing now that I'll be presenting uh, next week uh, in you know, how can these interorganizational collaborations actually be managed successfully because they have a lot of challenges. You know, you know, nobody, it's not one organization where I can sort of, I'm the boss, I can tell the employees what to do, there's no, you know, there's no real boss. How do you manage these successfully to actually uh, deliver something? How do you manage and govern them successfully? Uh, and then finally, and of course, a particular issue in, in Asia and the developing world, uh, a, a, I mean, there are corruption problems in business that are somewhat different, and, and they probably don't get enough attention in, in, in business, but clearly they are very, very special and important problems for the public sector and an important area of research. So all of these, and I'm really just about to be finished, he, these are areas that are not getting enough attention now in organization or research because there are those 17,000 people who are studying businesses and only 400 people studying the public sector. 
and the 17,000 people studying business don't really care about these that much generally because they're not so important in a business context, but they are important in a, in a, in a government and public sector context and, and, and thus need more, more attention. So I'm just going to conclude, but these are sort of the, sort of the two, the, this talk is based on two papers that I did uh, where, where I have the, uh, well, one paper and one, one chapter, uh, and I have the, uh, the references here. So uh, this is a chapter in, in uh, uh, the Academy of Management Annals, which is the annual sort of book put out by the Academy of Management. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, and actually has this title, Public Administration and Organization Studies. And then this shorter article I did in the Academy of Management Journal uh, called Public Management Needs Help. So if you want to, if I haven't bored you enough with what I've set up to now, and you, you, and you're, you're a, you, you want to be punished further and read more, you can uh, you know, read one or, or, or both of these sources. So uh, let me finish there. You've been a very patient audience on a Friday evening. Uh, I, 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 this is sort of my first lecture in my uh, Lee Kuan, Lee Kuan Yu, sorry, Lee Ka Shing um, uh, professorship. So uh, I, I appreciate your coming on this uh, on a late Friday afternoon. Thank you very much, Professor Kelman. That was a very clear uh, talk. I don't know which effect is greater for me. My uh, excitement that the Lee Kuan Yew School can use um, uh, some motivational involvement with our beneficiaries to raise more money, we should remember that, or my alarm that doctors need motivational messages to wash their hands before surgery. Uh, they do. <laughs> it's an alarming <laughs> thought. Uh, we do have uh, 10 minutes for a Q&A. So Dean, it's always best to call on the dean if his hand is up. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, uh, Steve. That was uh, fascinating. I must say, uh, I'm actually quite astonished that there are so few students here. And I'm going to send a note out myself to the students on Monday morning saying, what happened <laughs> uh, this evening? But I, uh, one of the most fascinating charts you showed, by the way, was the uh, sort of sudden leap in business articles in 1982-83. Yeah. And I'm actually surprised that you didn't mention that this coincided with Ronald Reagan's administration and with this famous, very famous statement that keeps sort of ricocheting around the world all the time, government is not the solution, mm -hmm. government is the problem. And I remember working in government then, even in Singapore, I felt a bit guilty <laughs> <laughs> about working in government because it was supposed to be second rate and we should all go into business and that's where the future is. So I wonder whether, uh, in terms of understanding why the, why the field went to disrepute, whether Reagan, the Reagan-Thatcher revolution had an impact. And I also remember that Al Gore tried, uh, I think in the mid-1990s, to try and spark an interest back into, and I remember the American newspapers poo-pooing him and making jokes about him and so saying, what's wrong with this guy? Doesn't he get it? Business is the real thing. Forget government. So is that part of the problem? That very, very interesting, uh, very interesting observation, not the least of somebody who has worked in the government for Al Gore for four years and worked on the, on, on the reinventing government program. And it, at some later point, if anyone is interested, I will contradict the point of view that, that Al Gore is a sort of boring person and so forth. Private, he's not boring at all. Uh, and he never claimed to invent the internet. No, the, many, of the, many of these statements are, 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 are completely untrue. Uh, but at any rate, be that as it may. What I would say, Kishore, is that um, I think absolutely the social trends and cultural trends really starting in the late 70s and going through the 80s somewhat declining in the 90s, and so we're sort of a little bit back and forth, but sort of that, that essentially sort of said a little bit what you're saying, that, you know, that government is terrible, government is the problem, no smart person would ever want to work in government, the real actors in business, clearly are an important part of what's going on. In addition to that, the changes in relative salaries. I mean, there's an amazing statistic in the US that in 1963, um, 
The starting salary of an attorney in the U.S. Department of Justice coming out of law school was something like 20% lower than a start, the starting salary on, in, a, in a New York law firm, Wall Street law firm, private law firm, not investment banker, but a lawyer. So in 63, the private sector paid 20% more than the government. Now, a Wall Street law firm pays three times as much as the starting salary of a Department of Justice attorney. So both those have happened. The only thing I would, the only thing I would say, and that was why I, looked, I wanted to look back to the history of the 40s and 50s, is by the time the 80s rolled around, a lot of the damage within academia to public administration had already been done. And so I think probably what happened, I guess my account of what happened in the 80s in terms of the impact on academia was not, I mean, I think public administration by that time as an academic discipline was already sort of in the, in the depths. What happened in the 80s was with the increased prestige of business is that business soared. So it was it, it, and it didn't soar, I think, in comparison to public administration. Public administration was already in a terrible situation. I think it soared maybe in relation to other academic disciplines to some extent. So I agree with you that this cultural development took place in the 80s. I think that a lot, however, I think that a lot of the damage in academia to public administration had already occurred before that, unfortunately. Jay? Yeah. Uh, I'm Wu Xin. I'm a faculty member uh, in this school, and, and I find the talks uh, fascinating. Um, I just have a, a question focusing on one of the uh, your uh, suggestions on um, you know study uh, performance, right? Because one of the I think that's yes. a key message here: studying performance here. Um, I just wonder, sort of, for when 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 uh, when you study performance of the public sector organization and how different it is from from studying. Um, private sector organization here, right? I mean, I can just give you one example of uh, the sector that I examine quite closely, the water sector, right? So uh, if, if you imagine the, uh, the task for uh, regulatory agencies of a municipal government, right? Basically look at uh, the water rates and so forth, right? So first of all, the question is that who, who, really the, who really are the customer of that agency here, right? It can be the, uh, uh, the, the water user, uh, who demand basically good quality of water and the cheap price. Then it can also be a taxpayer in general who basically demand the government to spend less money in the subsidy. Mm -hmm. Or the customer can be also be the, uh, the water utility who basically want to uh, make some healthy return out of you know, the kind of operation here. So, so, so that's the kind of first. And, and if you look at uh, uh, what the, how, to, how do you evaluate the performance of that agency here? Right. Should be in the form of good quality and cheap prices um, for the, uh, uh, you know, the, the water users, or should be the less subsidies uh, for taxpayer, or should be uh, something you know, like uh, the, 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 the welfare um, um, for the poor who may not be uh, uh, able to afford that? What would be the uh, potentially you know, the healthy uh, return for the investor? So, so when you look at those kind of different performances that are, that are quite important for that agency here, it it's still comes down to the question about uh, how do you settle the differences here, right? So it's, I think it's quite different from the business where, where you have uh, you know, one indicators that speak yes. for all. But here that you, have a, you have a bunch of indicators that are can potentially all quite important here. So the important question is not about whether or not you sh we should study performance, but the important question is how to settle uh, or, or, or what are the kind of principle and the process that you use to settle the differences across yeah. those different indicators? Yeah, that's a, you know, I'm so happy to be here because of these, both of these questions are so interesting and, and are, are so, uh, uh, that's a fantastic question. Let me, let me give some thoughts and if I, I uh, should, I'd be happy for you to give a reaction to, to my reaction so I'll have a little bit of a dialogue on this. In fact, for everybody, I should have said this to the dean as well, please, don't just see this as you ask a question, I give an answer. Please feel empowered to give your own reaction to my answer. I would say two things. Um, the fir and let's take, you know, there are, let's say there are four different dimensions. First of all, you're absolutely right. Of course, there are these different dimensions. And 
Sometimes, although that's, although not always, in fact, often I would say, that is an issue for business as well. That is to say, they do have this overall goal of, which is one goal, let's say, of maximizing profits. But in terms of the operational and management decisions a business makes, it needs to decide, let's take it very oversimplified, do you want to be a low cost producer or a high, or a high quality producer, you know, what, uh, and you know, which is the way to get better profits. So, so even though at some, at the end of the day, I'm going to talk about for business, there is, there may be this one measure, they also face some trade-offs among some different performance measures at one, one level lower down. But clearly within government, and your water example is, a, is an excellent one, let's say there are the, you know, these different measures. So I'd say two things. The first thing I would say is to use economics language, I want to be able to use, to pay attention to performance and improving performance so as to, again, using economics language, move out the, the uh, production possibility frontier. That is to say, are there ways I can manage these organizations that by just managing more effectively or designing policies more effectively can simultaneously improve performance over you know, more than one of these dimensions. So to some extent, there are trade-offs, but they're all, I mean, you know, there are also efficient Pareto improvements to use economics language. That is to say, ways that I can manage and run these organizations better, that I do better on one of the dimensions, and at a, at a minimum, not worse on others, and maybe even better on more than one dimension. And I want to pay attention to performance as a government and as a, as a, as a leader of, of, an, of one of these organizations to find way, I, mean, I suspect that many government organizations, if not most, are, again, to use economics language, way inside a Pareto frontier. That is to say, there are ways they could improve their management that would improve several of these performance dimensions simultaneously. So that's my first uh, uh, you know, thought. My second thought is, you're right, I mean, uh, let's say there are these different dimensions, let's say, providing lower water prices for consumers and... I'm, oh, oh I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. When you finish, he's got a point. Oh, okay, very good, sure. Um, uh, you know, you have different dimensions that may be in, in conflict with each other. You're absolutely right. Ultimately, of course, it's a political decision about which one, you know, how much you want to emphasize one or the other and, 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 and so forth. I think that the political decision makers need guidance in making those political decisions from seeing, first of all, again, that organizations are as, uh, as close to the Pareto frontier as possible. That is to say, are along each of the dimensions acting as efficiently as possible so that the political decision makers can then say, all right, you've done the most you can to, to bring costs down. At this point, you can't bring them down any further without compromising something else we care about. And then the politicians need to decide which value is more important. You're absolutely right. You can't avoid the value decisions. But by focusing on the issue of performance, even if it's on several dimensions, I think it, ha it, 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 bring, it, um, it both increases the probability that you're going to do better in total, you know, it's sort of adding up the dimensions than, than if you didn't pay attention to this. And also, I think it will get better information to the decision makers about the nature of the trade-offs among the different dimensions. I don't know, Sean, if you want to respond or, or react, and I, a colleague also wants. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I agree to, uh, with uh, your point in principle. I just thought, uh, I think that it's just in, uh, in, uh, in actual cases, how do you really kind of operationalize, uh, you know, that, the concept so, so, so that balances can be done meaningfully, right? Because the, the example that I gave earlier uh, is that in, in, uh, in Manila, the, the water regulatory, uh, uh, regulatory agency actually 
award themselves about uh, 23 months of uh, bonuses uh, based on one indicator. The indicator of performance they use is that uh, after they conduct a rate review, there's no complaint from industry player, no complaint right. from the customer. So, right. so that so, is a, that okay. is enough good performance indicators for them to award them 23 months of bonuses. So, right. so, so, so I, I think eventually it's a come down to the question of how how exactly in the actual CEO cases yeah. how do you operationalize? Okay, good. Uh, so, different, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Let me do, let me just give a quick response, and I think our colleague wants to come in. First, I'm actually one of the papers I'm presenting here at at, at LKY is a empirical paper I've done in the British National Health Service that deals with exactly the kind, it's an empirical examination of the kind of worry you are expressing in the Manila situation where you basically have a measure that only looks at one dimension of performance and it creates distortions. I mean, you know, if you, just, if you measure people just on the basis of no complaints, they will keep the prices very low even, you know, at the cost of enormous subsidies. So I, I'll be talking a little bit more about that in, 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 in another paper. But I guess the, the point, I guess what my, I, I think as a practical matter, I think that let's say the politicians say the only value we care about is um, making sure that the prices are low to the consumer. Uh, that if you don't have, you know, without performance measurement, let's say of costs or whatever, there is no incentive at all for the water authority to, you know, to use resource, you know, to be a steward of resources and to just sort of not waste a lot of money on, 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 you know, on uh, all sorts of things that don't even necessarily improve water quality or even or or, or, or you know, reduce prices. So if you're not measuring the performance along that other dimension. You're just you're going to create a situation where the performance is terrible along that dimension. Um, we can continue this conversation, please. We're actually out of time, oh, yeah. uh, so if you could keep your comments uh, very short and Sorry. crisp, and then you could have a, a, a brief rejoinder. We have Tian, Jan, and Ed. No, quickly, as you well know, to use again economics language, Pareto ordering is a partial ordering, and so it doesn't order all the possible choices. Using Pareto criterion, you get only a partial ordering. From the context of, from the context that you're using performance, I would have thought moving from inside the frontier to, to the frontier is essentially getting the low hanging fruits. The more difficult issue is to provide the decision maker with the menu which is already on the frontier and so the harder decisions of trade-offs between different objectives is posed to the policymaker, not so much the, the one you are talking about, namely moving to the frontier. That's low-hanging fruit. I, I th I th the, I'll give a one-sentence answer, which there are lots of governments in the world where that fruit may in theory be low-hanging, but in practice, it's not low-hanging. <laughs> Question. Yes, short question. <clears throat> it's about um, performance of a place that's very dear to m most of us, um, public policy schools. And I was wondering if you have any, or let's say there is um, there's an advertising campaign in Singapore at the moment for a new university for technology and design. And they advertise, and they partnered with MIT, and they advertise with this, there's a mountain rock somewhere a student hanging there with a, with a mobile phone and they have a solar charger for this phone. And they, the, the advertisement says, solar charger invented by MIT students and then something about how great this new university is. Um, and we just had a debate yesterday in our um, PhD room about the value of uh, public administration programs and public policy programs. And to what extent can we quantify the impact and the performance that our schools bring out? And I was wondering if you have any insights into that. Uh, so the answer, again, I'll be a short answer for reasons of time, is this is a, the, the answer is it's a, it's a poorly developed art. And we are, we're beginning at the Kennedy School in executive education to experiment. I mean, we always ask students in all these programs, do you like the classes and so forth? But we're beginning, we're, 
just starting in executive education, not for our degree programs, but for the people who are already executives, to do something where we actually ask their bosses whether their behavior and performance on the job improved or changed after they went to our executive education programs. Uh, but even that is, a, is at a very primitive level, uh, and it's, it's still very tentative. Uh, so the short answer, I think we still, we, the public policy school, still have a lot to do in that area. And you're hoping that it didn't get worse. We're hoping <laughs> it didn't get worse. <laughs> well, please join me in thanking Professor Kalman for an excellent talk. Uh, and do note he'll be speaking several more times in his uh, weeks here at the Lee Kuan Yew School, so uh, please come by for that as well.